Good morning. Glad to see you at Hardison Baptist Church today. Let's turn, get our song books and turn to 303 and let's stand as we sing glory to God, to his name. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was a blood applied. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was a blood applied. Glory to his name. I am so wondrously saved from sin. So sweetly abides within There at the cross where it took me in Glory to His name Glory to His name Glory to His name There to my heart was a blood applied Glory to His name 
fountain that saves from sin. I am so gladly I've entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood of fountain so rich and sweet cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet plunge in today and be made complete glory to his name glory to his name glory to his name there to my heart was a blood of light to his name. Amen. So good to see you guys here with us at Hardison Baptist Church this morning. I'd like to ask uh, Brother Scott if you would open us in a word of prayer, please, sir. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, it's good to see you all again. So I said that already, but um, just want to. You've been looking at your bulletin, the announcements on the screen. So just uh, know those things that are coming up. Of course, a week from today is Mother's Day. So we look forward to that here at Hardison Baptist Church and also just in our families in general. Um, on the 15th, which is a Wednesday night, the uh, Ronnie and Jonathan Altry will be with us. So I hope you'll make plans to be with us that evening. We'll be hearing from them. Uh, uh, gift from the Word of God and a testimony of what he's been doing, what the Lord's been doing there in the Dominican Republic. Um, May 25th, monthly men's meeting. Um, we'll get more details as we get closer. And then the 26th, we'll have a, a cookout that afternoon, so uh, that Sunday afternoon. So I hope that you'll make plans for that. The sign-up sheet there on the table in the foyer. So we'd we'll love for you to sign up for that and look forward to being with us on that day. Um, happy birthday wishes to Janet Bennett. Uh, on Thursday on the 9th, and then also my wife on Thursday on the 9th. So happy birthday to them. Uh, neither are with us this morning, but you can, when you see them or give them a call or shoot them a text, they would let them know you're um, praying for them and wish them a happy birthday. Um, please do remember that we are temporarily suspending the Sunday evening services. So just uh, thank you for cooperating. And Well, you don't have to cooperate. You can come, but it uh, <laughs> might be a little awkward. But uh, thank you for understanding that. Uh, I got this uh, note from the lanes here. It says, Dear HBC family, words could never express our gratitude for the kindness you all have extended to us. We are so grateful for the friendships we've made, for the fellowship we've enjoyed, and for the forever memories that have been made here at Hardison. We love you all, Brother Jim and Sandra. So just a thank you note from them. We just really appreciate their service here, what the Lord had for them here and for us uh, under their leadership. And we're thankful for that. Uh, just do continue to pray for the uh, church as we look forward to what God has for us next. We're eagerly anticipating that and hopefully uh, get that ball rolling sooner rather than later. And we're looking forward to that as well. Um, I think today is uh, Stand with Israel Day, and uh, I believe I could probably say that I would, I would dare say 100% of us stand with Israel. I do hope that's your, your uh, mentality. Um, the Stand with Israel Day is a day that we want to just, uh, pastors and, preacher, and preachers and churches across America and probably the world, want to pray for Israel specifically. I, I hope that you're praying for Israel in your personal prayer life, but uh, this morning I want to take a moment and pray for Israel <clears throat> as they're just under attack. But uh, God is bigger in so many ways. You can read through the whole Old Testament, and many times they were attacked, but God is bigger. 
But let's pray for them right now. We're living in a moment where we're seeing them being physically attacked. And let's ask for God's protection on them. Father, we thank you for the nation of Israel. We thank you for your chosen people. And Lord, we pray for them. We pray that you protect them. We pray that you would give them wisdom. Give them your strength and grace as they face these challenges and face uh, Satan's attacks <clears throat> that are uh, physical. They're also uh, geographical. Uh, Lord, of course, they're, they're spiritual as well. But Lord, we ask that you would increase their strength, increase their faith. And Lord, uh, most importantly, I pray for those uh, Jewish people and Israelites that have not trusted in the Messiah, that have not trusted in Jesus Christ as their Savior. Lord, that you would save their souls and you would use them as you have prophesied all through the Old Testament and even in the New. Lord, we just ask that you would have your hand upon them, protect them, give them the strength they need, the wisdom they need, the discernment they need in this time of war. And Lord, we just ask that your uh, the enemies be defeated and that your name be glorified. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. And with that, we'll ask Brother Charles to come and lead us in some more songs. As we continue, let's turn to fa page 541. <laughs> Within my heart a melody, Jesus whispers sweet and low, fear not I am with thee, peace be still, and all eyes will swell and flow, Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every singing as I go. All my life was wrecked by sin and strife. This world filled my heart with fear. Jesus swept across the broken streams, turned the storming towards again. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Feasting on the riches of His grace, resting neath the covering wings. Always looking on His smiling face, that is why I shout and sing. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. This name I know fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Soon he's coming back to welcome me, far beyond the starry sky. I shall wing my flights to worlds unknown, I shall reign with him on high. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. All right, and as we continue, let's turn to ta page 244. What a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs> Take it 
to the Lord in prayer. voice will hold out on this song that I'm going to do. When you make your final entrance to that city of jasper walls and bright golden avenues and when you behold all his beauty and splendor. Remember there's just one request I ask of you. Look for me, for I will be there too. I realize when you arrive, there'll be so much to view. After you've been there 10,000 years, a million, maybe two. Look for me, for I will be there too. And when you go down your list of first, there's no question. There'll be loved ones waiting there for you. And when you feel you've shared the last word, just remember... I'll be there, so look for me, for I will be there too. Look for me, for I will be there too. I realize when you and gone, there'll be so much to view. After you've been there 10,000 years, or millions or two, look for me. For I will be there too. Look for me. For I will be there too. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Charles. All right, little ones, you are younger ones, I should say. Y'all are dismissed. All right.
You good, Bruce? You good? You all right? Okay, all right. I'll just make sure y'all keep him straight. Bye, Maylee. <laughs> Precious sight. People say, that's the future of the church. I don't know about the future. They're here now. So let's, uh, let's pour into them now. And we're so thankful for those that do. And uh, thankful for uh, those that bring the kids. And we're just so delighted they could be with us. And just pray for those that are in the back. But uh, ministering there. Well, it's good to see you. I know I've said that a few times this morning, but it's true. If you weren't here, it'd be really awkward. So we're just glad you're here. Take your Bibles. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. If you have headings in your Bible or you're a somewhat Bible scholar, you know that we just turned to where there enters David onto the scene. David is somebody that if you were to ask probably anybody on the street, anybody anywhere to name five people in the Bible, his name would probably almost always be one that's mentioned. He's very prominent through the uh, Old Testament, through the, uh, if, you came, if you ever went to vacation Bible school, you probably heard about David and all the things that he did, his mighty works, his, his triumphs, his falls. But you know what? what? This is what I love about David. He was human. Sometimes we tend to put people on a pedestal, whether they be Bible characters, which were people, by the way, just like me and you, or whether they be people that we know today or or of yesteryear. But David was a normal human being that God chose to do mighty things. But David also had a sin nature just like everybody else. I'm not so much going to get into any of that to this morning, but... Those are the things, some of the things that pop up and, you know, you, you say, well, w- w- if somebody were to ask you, what do you think of when you hear the name David? There are a few things that probably pop up and that would be the, the top answers. Uh, David killed Goliath. That would probably be right up there. That's, that's, sun, that's Sunday school and VBS material right there. You know, boy, oh boy. It's, all right, tell me about that story again. Uh, there's also, uh, you might hear somebody say, Oh, well, uh, he sinned with Bathsheba. And that might be one of the top three answers. And then the third thing might be, he was a man after God's own heart. You know, there are people that will criticize David and his character and that phrase that he was a man after God's own heart because of that second answer I gave you. He sinned with Bathsheba. He had her husband murdered. And then the baby died, and, 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 and so it was, a, it was a mess. But remember, I've stated that David was a human. He wasn't some perfect person. He wasn't somebody chosen by God to walk us, this earth in a sinless manner. Only one person, and that was Jesus Christ, did that. But David was a person with temptations like we have, with, with flesh struggles like we have, But I just want us to see the introduction of David here in 1 Samuel 16 this morning. And then we'll proceed through this, the life of David as the Lord leads uh, on Sunday mornings. But here in verse 1, we're going to start in verse 6. 1 Samuel 16, verse 6. Well, let me bring it to speed since we're not starting in verse 1. Saul is the, is the king right now. If we were to go backwards in 1 Samuel, it wouldn't take long, especially if you have headings in your Bible, to see that Saul has been disobedient to the Lord. He's done things that don't please the Lord. And because of that, here, here's, here's one thing we, we have to remember that don't ever forget that When disobedience to God is done, consequences will happen. You say, yeah, but we should forgive. Absolutely. We should absolutely forgive. 
But please don't equate forgiveness with lack of consequences. Saul had disobeyed God. If we were to go back in 1 Samuel, we could look at it and pull those things from Scripture, but we won't for time's sake. And because of that, God said, I need to anoint the next king. Saul's not my chosen man anymore. And so he tells Samuel, let's, let's do start in verse 1. The, it, the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have pro provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. That's what state Saul was in at this point. That if he heard that his prophet or representative of the Lord was going to, to anoint the next king, he would just kill Samuel. He says, how can I do it? He will kill me. He says, and, and the Lord said, take an heifer with thee and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. Verse 3, and call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do, and thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Comest thou peaceably? In verse 5 he said, Peaceably. I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. Now, he's there on official business from the Lord to anoint the next king of Israel. And this is where, I, I'm, I, would, I would imagine most of us, this is familiar territory as far as Bible study goes, but I hope that this morning we can pull some things out, going to kind of go through like a little buffet, pull some nuggets out uh, as we look at God's Word and, and uh, be a challenge and encouragement to us this morning. Let's, let's open with a word of prayer for, for the preaching time. Father, we thank you for the time we could be together. Lord, I do thank you that you've preserved your word so that we could study it in its purest form this morning. Well, we know that uh, you want us to study and read and know your word so that we can grow closer to you and be more like you. I pray this morning you calm our hearts. I imagine there's some concerns and cares, uh, maybe distractions in our minds and hearts this morning. But Lord, I pray that you would help us to put those aside for a few moments as we just dive into your word and just, Lord, just uh, speak to us. Well, thank, you. thank you for your salvation. Thank you for forgiveness of sins. Thank you for loving us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, verse 6 is where we start getting into some interesting texts here. In verse 6, the Bible says, And it came to pass, when they were come, that he looked on Eliab, that's Samuel, looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. So the word surely is a bad word in my vocabulary. The reason the word surely is a bad word in my vocabulary is because when we, got into bit, when we started the business in 2008, uh, we went all in. It was an all or nothing thing. My dad, I was working for him at the time, but we were working, he was working out of town over in Alabama. And so for me to get started in the business, it was hard to do that on the weekend. So I just stayed home and hit the, hit the ground running, so to speak. And... Along the way, this phrase was said in our household, something like this. Surely we'll be able to sell one driveway a month that we can clean it and stain it. Surely we'll have some work very soon. Surely, surely things will go well for it. The Lord will bless our business. And fast forward, it was a very slow start. Now, you remember 2008 was an economy crash and staining concrete wasn't at the top of people's list to do when the economy was crashing and tanking. I did end up going back to work with my dad uh, as we just saw the business try to get it started. And the Lord provided. He took care of us. But surely, 
is a word now that we just aren't, no, we don't use that phrase anymore. It's a, it's a joke, but here he said when I, I was reading through this, and, and uh, I, didn't, I didn't remember that this was said like this, but that's what Samuel says. And he got caught in the same spot I did. He said, he saw um, Eliab and he said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. He said, wow, look at this guy. My goodness, this has to be God's pick. Look at him. Because remember, Jesse's just parading his sons in front of Samuel. Well, only one at this time because Jesse most likely started with the best. Maybe the oldest, whatever the case might be. And he said, go ahead, buddy. Go make me proud. And as he, Eliab walks across in front of, maybe he's got his chest out. You know, like me, I hold my stomach in more and as I get older, you know. So, and he, he looks proper. And he walks in front of Samuel. And Samuel goes, oh, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. And he's waiting on the Lord to say, that's him, Sammy. Go ahead and anoint him. In verse 17, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Now, when, just, just side note, when he says he's refused him, that doesn't mean that he's condemned and going to hell. It means he wasn't the next king. He says, that's not my pick. I refuse him. Okay? You're looking, Sammy, you're looking on the outward appearance. Yeah, he looks great. He's big and strong. But I'm looking at his heart. Now, was he a wicked man? Well, he was born a sinner. But it doesn't get into the heart issues of Jesse's sons here. It just says this wasn't the right one. Verse 8, well, before we, before we proceed, let me, let me read you. This is one of, the, one of the nuggets on the buffet this morning. When verse 7, the latter part, it says, For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. what does God see when he looks at our heart? Because he knows it. He knows what's in our heart. I can stand up here behind this desk and preach to you the word of God, but God knows my heart. Now, I'm not trying to say I'm hiding something here, but my point is all you see is what I allow you to see. Right? And I'm, I'm not saying, don't read into this, Brother Bob, but I'm not saying that there's some hidden thing going on and I'm just hinting around hoping you'll call me out on it. Am I a sinner? Absolutely. My attitude rotten sometimes? Unfortunately. But God sees our heart. What is it that He sees in our heart? Proverbs 4.23 says, let me get back to my notes. I thought I remembered it. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Okay, we've all got a heart. We're not talking about the one that pumps the blood. But instead, we're talking about who we are. At the core, our character Keep thy heart. Keep who you are. Guard it with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. I learned this phrase when I went to college. The phrase is, what is it? Well, I'm going to say it in a question almost. What is your worldview? That's the phrase, worldview. And I learned that we all have a worldview. And that worldview is shaped by what we allow to shape us, what we allow to influence us, what we allow to infiltrate our innermost being. 
like when you are around someone who spends a lot of time in the Word of God, their worldview is very biblical. It's usually refreshing. I say usually because there are, I have been around those that seem to take the condemnation side of the Word of God very very, heart, very to heart, and they want to make sure you know that you're not living up to God's standards. Are we? Probably not in some form or fashion, but boy, we just don't need to be beat down every time we get confronted about something like that, is it? Absolutely not. What about someone who watches any news network? I'm not going to name one. I'm just going to say any news network, and that becomes your main focus. What happens to your worldview? I'm not going to say it goes bad or good or, or either way, but I'm, my, the point is your worldview is shaped by what you listen to or watch or take in. What about your choice of music? What about your choice of television shows or entertainment? Those things shape us. This uh, generation that are in their late teens, well, they're probably from the early teens up to about 25 or so, has had an influx of external influence that we didn't see, okay? We didn't. Brittany might have, you might be on the, on the edge of that, but for the most part, the age group here, we didn't have that massive influence in our life. Why? What's the contributing factor? cell phones, internet, iPads. I'm not blaming a, a device, okay? It's going to rain in Antarctica today. <laughs> or in Anchorage, I'm sorry, the, on my screen. But you know, we, I just got influenced by a weather app. Now, we're influenced by those things too. But it's almost like, and I'm not trying to defend my generation and older, but it's, uh, it's almost like we had some time to get some good grounding. And I'm not saying that younger kids don't have that chance, but it's very difficult. Very, very difficult. Kids are wanting cell phones earlier and earlier. Parents are giving them to them earlier and earlier. And that's, that's between them and their children, the parents and their children. But the influence that comes through these devices can be great, but a lot of times it's not, is it? What is our world view? When you're asked about politics or about uh, finances or about quote-unquote religion, what is your world view and where does it come from? Do you know any topic, any topic you could come up with is addressed in the Word of God? Maybe not directly. Well, does it say anything about smoking? Well, maybe not directly. Does it say anything about, and you name these, these new things, but the general principle is in the Word of God. We should be studying God's Word. Hey, you're here this morning. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that you're here. You're hearing the Word of God. Maybe some are watching via live stream or, or going to watch later. That's great. We should be learning. We should be digging into God's Word because our worldview will be based off of what we allow to influence us. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Listen to this out of Matthew 15. <clears throat> when the Pharisees confronted Jesus about he and his disciples not washing their hands before eating, Jesus said this, in, starting in verse 18. Matthew 15, verses 18 through 20. The Bible says, But those things which, this is Jesus talking, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, theft, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. 
See, the Pharisees were trying to nitpick something about Jesus and his disciples because they just went through and grabbed grain on this certain occasion and they just started eating. Now, I think after 2020 and COVID-19, we all learned, shame on us for having to learn this, we need to keep our hands washed. It's a good practice. That's the loudest amen I got from some people. I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. But it, we should keep our hands washed because there's germs everywhere. <clears throat> Jesus is not saying, fooey on washing your hands. He goes to the heart issue. He tells the Pharisees, he says, look, those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile a man. And he names some things in verse 19. It says, evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashing hands defileth not a man. He says, hey, bub, you got it wrong. You're all concerned about washing your hands and how you look on the outside, but it's your heart that's the problem. Jesus knows our heart. He knows what we're thinking. He knows our thoughts. He knows our imaginations. He knows those things. If they're not pleasing to Him at this moment in time in your life or in my life, we should surrender that to Him and say, God, forgive me, and He will. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's not a lost cause. Guard your heart, for out of it are the issues of life. So back to the text, <clears throat> goes through the passage of Scripture here, through the verses. Jesse has sent all of his sons before Samuel, and the Lord rejected them all as the next king of Israel. Perplexed, Samuel asked if he had any more sons. He's, then, he's marched them all past, and Samuel goes, I don't know what's going on here. God sent me here to, to this man to anoint one of his sons. And now he's put them all in front of me, and God said no to all of them. And so he just has to ask this somewhat rhetorical, silly question, do you have any more sons? Did we forget one? <clears throat> and he says in verse 11, Jesse said, uh, there remaineth yet the youngest, and, and behold, he, he keepeth the sheep. It almost sounds like Jesse didn't think David was good enough. It's what it sounds like. I'm, I'm reading on the surface here, not digging deep on that thought. Because he didn't even bother to bring him up there. But Samuel said to go get David, and he says, we're not even going to rest till he gets here. You go get him. He's probably a little uh, like a... Uh, it's probably like he's getting on to... Jesse a little bit because he said bring your sons before me he brought all but one and now they got to wait on someone to go out into the fields find David and bring him back he's probably a little frustrated of I asked you to bring your sons before me and now you brought all but one and the one is the one I need to see 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 12 <clears throat> The Bible says, And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and withal of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Before you go back and say, Well, earlier in verse 6 or verse 7, we made the point, you made the point that, that the Lord said he doesn't look on the outward appearance. The Lord didn't say, man, this guy looks good. It was an observation about David that he was ruddy, meaning my understanding of this, I tried, I'm like, this should be a simple definition when I was looking it up means he had probably had red, red freckles of some sort, red hair possibly, fairer skinned than other men in his family. you got to remember where they're from, where they're at. And then it says he was 
withal of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. Some other versions say that uh, they take the, count, the beautiful countenance and say he had beautiful eyes. You ever seen somebody that just has amazing eyes? It's just like, whoa. Like you could just peer into their soul or something. It's like, man, wow, that is so cool. But he, so he was an attractive young man, but that's not why God chose him. As per verse 7. But he did choose him. He says, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. So David's in his teens when Samuel anoints him as the next king of Israel. Then Saul, the current king, uh, has disobeyed the Lord enough that he will have an evil spirit, the Bible tells us, from time to time. David is brought in to play his harp and to soothe the king. Listen to 1 Samuel 16, verses 17 and 18. And Saul said unto his servants, <clears throat> Provide me now a man that can play well and bring him to me. Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite that is cunning and plain and a mighty valiant man and a man of war and prudent in matters. And a comely person. And the Lord is with him. What did Saul ask for? He asked for somebody to play a harp and soothe him. But look at the answer that was given about David. From man's perspective. He says. He is cunning and plain and a mighty valiant man and a man of war and prudent smart wise in matters and a comely or handsome person and the lord is with him that's impressive that's a pretty neat resume that the people observed about this shepherd boy one of jesse's sons my question to you little nugget here <clears throat> If a Bible verse was written about you, what would it say? If a, if a Bible verse were written about you, what would it say? Kind of goes back to the heart matter. What is our heart? What is our being? Who, what's at our core? How do we display that to others? How do we act? Would we get high marks like David did here? We should be striving to have a great testimony for the Lord. And we should live in a way that our lives glorify the Lord every day. That's what we should be striving for. Will we always hit the mark? No. That's just living in this flesh. That's just where we're at. But we should be striving for that. Now to the end of the chapter. Look at verse 23. And it came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took an harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. This evil spirit from the Lord comes to Saul. Now, you go, man, that just, that just sounds contrary. An evil spirit from the Lord. Remember, we are before Christ, before Christ's ascension into heaven when he would leave us the Holy Spirit. And so at this point in history, there is no indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We believe now that the Bible teaches, once saved, you're always saved. John 3.16 says we have everlasting life. And these, said that there's another verse, I don't remember the reference, says no man can pluck you out of the Father's hand. 
That man includes me. Oh, well, some people say you can, you can give your salvation back. You can't. Why would you want to? And if you get to that point, it is a good viable question to say, was that person ever truly saved? Or were they just running through some motions? I'm not here to say that's what's happening and you should, you should talk to your neighbor about that. I'm just saying those are possibilities. But we believe that once we're saved, we're always saved. The Bible teaches an eternal security. But what is our life? How does it look? How do we play out? How do we show others Christ in us? So when David was giving these attributes, it makes me wonder, how do we affect those that we're around? How do we affect those that we're around? When we're around them, are they soothed like when David played his harp for Saul? Do we bring a word of encouragement? Or do we bring not so great things? What kind of vibe do we bring to a room? And I wrote these things, uh, uh, nothing in these names. But are we negative Nancys? Are we murmuring Marks? Or are we encouraging Edwards? Or positive Patties? Tried to pick names that <laughs> I knew wouldn't probably be here this morning. So you're not like, hey, I'm, my name's Edward. I'm encouraging him. You know, just what, what pr- we bring a presence to a room when we enter it. What? Is it? What do we bring into that room? That might be the Bible verse that's written about us, if there were a Bible verse written about us. Hey, when Bryant came into the room, it changed in this way, or it didn't change at all, or it got like this, or it went from that to this. What kind of what kind of vibe, what kind of spirit energy do we bring? And I don't mean that in some new age way. I mean, what are we, what are we bringing to the people around us? I just have a couple of dew points. We've kind of already talked about it, but I wanted to reiterate it. Is what's your heart like? What is your worldview based on? Is it based on the Word of God, or are you infiltrated with this culture and you name it? Or are we we have a worldview that's based on God's Word? And then the I didn't I didn't phrase it this way during the message, but basically at this moment in time, what would your legacy be? If your funeral was today. And when everybody came in, we had a a serum. Bear with Let me move over here while I do this hypothetical situation. We have a serum that we sprayed through those doors as people came in those doors and as they came in back here that was a truth serum. And we said, and we asked everybody at the funeral today, what do you think about, what do you think about that person? Because, you know, let's just be honest. I don't know about funerals anywhere, but funerals in the South are usually pretty nice. They're pretty polite. You could have some dirty, rotten scoundrel, and they're going to say good things. They're going to find something good about them. What, what was that, uh, the story where the guy had a, <clears throat> the, the, the brothers, uh, the one brother passed away, and the other brother went to the pastor in town and said, I want you to do, do the funeral, but I don't want you to say anything bad about him. And he was like, and that was like, whoa, because the guy had a rotten, rotten, reputation funeral day came preacher got up started speaking the guys the the family sitting right here and he said you know he said i want you to say good things about him and he said well you know let's just face it community he was a thief a liar he had a bad attitude he stole from people but compared to his brother he was a saint (laughs) <laughs> you know, I mean, just the, what would people say about us if our funeral was today and they had to tell the truth? What kind of legacy do we have at this moment? If you don't like the answer that you're coming up with, 
guess what? Your funeral is not today. And you have time to change it. What will you do about it? First and foremost, do you know Christ as your Savior? Do you know that when eternity starts for you, will you be with Christ in eternity? And do you have a Bible reason for that? Or is it a hope-so salvation? I have a no-so salvation. I hope you do as well. But what kind of legacy will you leave at this moment? And what's your heart like? The Bible says in Proverbs 4.23, we talked about already, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Father, we thank you for the time we could be together. Lord, we thank you for your word <clears throat> that we could look at this morning and the, the beginning, the introduction to David in the Bible. We thank you that we could see some things this morning from his anointing and from uh, his playing of the harp and what you saw when you saw David, what others saw when they saw David. And we could be challenged and encouraged by it. I pray that you would help us to think about these questions, to meditate on them, and to know, first of all, that we know Christ is our Savior. And then secondly, what kind of worldview are we having? What's, what's, what's influence in our heart? What kind of legacy are we leading and leaving right now? Lord, draw us closer to you. Help us as we respond to your moving in this next few moments. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand as Miss Donna plays to respond as, uh, to the Holy Spirit's moving. And just to respond in your seat, come down forward, whatever the Lord is laying on your heart. I trust that you'll do that. Thank you so much for your attention this morning, for being here. just want to look around and see if you see some folks missing. Just give them a call or shoot them a text and let them know you missed them this morning. And uh, just uh, be an encouragement to them. Justin, did you get my message? Okay. All right.